Ryan Lavarnaway. Shalom and welcome to the Baseball Bookshelf. Ron, how are you? Good, good. Uh, unfortunately, this comes post Hanukkah because your new book, Baseball and Belonging, I, I imagine was a very popular uh, gift for, for the season. Uh, how did this come about? Um, I was encouraged to write this kid's book by my rabbi after I had been speaking to adult audiences about my Jewish identity story. Uh, and the short version of that is for, you know, for you and for those that don't know, uh, I was raised with no religion in my house. My mom is Jewish and loves Christmas more than anyone I know. And my dad is a, a disenchanted Catholic is I think what he would say. So we celebrated holidays from both Christianity and Judaism, but for no religious significance significance we just celebrated hallmark holidays uh and it wasn't it wasn't until i played for team israel that i really started understanding and appreciating and being proud of my own judaism uh, and playing for team israel really changed my life so uh i was speaking about this and my rabbi was like listen kids need to hear the story about how you chose judaism and you found it through pursuing your passion through sports uh, and that's not a story that you hear often. So I turned it into a kid's book and it's been really well received so far. Everyone's loving it. And I'm just so happy that uh, people are, are seeing themselves in it and, and taking something out of it. Now, people who follow my blog know that I almost never uh, do anything with books for kids because yeah. there's so much of it out there. But this spoke to me because I am also Jewish. Uh, I've been following Jewish ball players uh, for my whole life. When I was a sports editor for the New Jersey Jewish News, I had a blog about Jews and sports uh, that that did weekly follow-ups on the progress of the Jews playing that season. And of course, you were among them. Uh, how did you come to be on Team Israel for the World Baseball Classic? I got a call from Peter Kurz, who's the president of the Israeli Association of Baseball. And he basically just said, hey, is this something you'd be interested in? And honestly, the first time that he approached me was in 2012. I was still uh, getting my feet underneath me in the big leagues with the Red Sox at the time. I was, I had my rookie status. And I said, listen, I, I'm planning and hoping to be in the major leagues during the qualifier because Israel needed to qualify to enter the main tournament, being ranked 42nd in the world at the time. Uh, I said, if I'm available, heck yeah, let's do it, because USA is not calling me. Like, why wouldn't I uh, use this loophole rule to play for another team, even if I'm not connected with Israel in, a, in any way at that point? Okay, um, excuse me. Explain that loophole rule, please. The loophole. Okay, so the World Baseball Classic was um, – created in 2006 for the first time by major league baseball and the players association in a joint venture the goal of the world baseball classic was to grow the popularity of baseball worldwide because ultimately baseball is a north american sport and uh east like a northeast asian sport and maybe some latin america but that's it baseball doesn't have the international popularity that soccer has uh that basketball has in some ways so in order to help countries that are not traditional powerhouses participate and to give those countries a team to support, to root for, to cheer for, you don't actually have to have an active passport of a country to represent that country. You just have to qualify to be able to obtain a passport. So and Jews have that. I'm not going to call it dual citizenship, but if you're Jewish, well, the law of return, right? Law of return in Israel, um, because Israel was established as a safe haven country for, uh, you know, the only Jewish state in the world. Anybody with at least one Jewish grandparent or one Jewish parent uh, practices Jewish religion actively or has a Jewish spouse. Basically, the same rules that the Nazis used to kill people, yeah. right? You can find safe haven in Israel. Um, so because of that law of return, any Jewish person worldwide can represent Israel in this baseball tournament. So at the time I was first approached, I, I hadn't connected with my own Judaism yet. I had no ties to Israel. But 
I qualified because my mom's Jewish. So I said, heck yeah, let's do it. Then I was in the big leagues. I wasn't able to play. Four years later, they asked, hey, if you're, if you're available, would you play? And I said, sure, you know, if I'm available. And I wasn't in the big league, so I, I played in the qualifier in 2016. Um, and it turned out to be a really meaningful experience in a, in a transformational part of my life. Um, and they ended up taking 10 of us to Israel in person. This is what you're playing for. This is what it's all about. Meet the people, taste the food, see the sights. Uh, and that trip ended up changing my life. And now I am very connected to my Judaism. Uh, I have now established dual citizenship in Israel, and I do have an active passport. Uh, and it's, you know, this this transformation for me internally is is what the, the book is about. You, you mentioned uh, the Nazis, of course. It, it seems that every generation or so there is a significant Jewish presence, be it a ball player or in the case of the World Baseball Classic, the, the Israel team, Hank Greenberg in 1938. Uh, was vying for the home run record against Babe Ruth, uh, was victim of anti-Semitism, was rife in that country at the time. A generation later, you had Sandy Koufax, who had declined to play uh, the first game of the 1965 World Series because it fell on Yom Kippur. And then you had uh, uh, a glut of prominent Jewish players. You had Ryan Braun, Ian Kinsler, uh, yourself, Craig Breslow, who is a uh, schoolmate of yours in a sense, having having both been uh, uh, to Yale and played on the Red Sox at the same time. And, and then you have, of course, the Cinderella story that was the Israel baseball team. So that, that must have been a, an amazing experience. Uh, we certainly read about it here. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering what your sense is. I don't know if you're familiar with this new United Baseball League in uh, in the Middle East. Uh, there are four teams. Uh, their their claim is they are the first professional baseball to be played in the Middle East, which is not true because in 2007, and only in 2007, you had the Israel Baseball League, which uh, I'm wondering if now that Israel has had that experience with the success of the the world baseball classic do you think there's any chance that uh, did, did the united baseball situation spent a boatload of money on fixing up stadiums and media presence and whatnot and the uh, israel baseball league did not have that kind of uh, gravitas so i'm 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 wondering i doubt it but i'm wondering if you think there's a renewed interest in baseball in israel when they they are hopefully soon one day out of this terrible situation. That was a long question and I'm not a hundred percent sure uh, what you're getting at. I think what you're asking is, do you, do I think there could be another professional baseball league in Israel? Or, or even if baseball has, because of the success of the team in the world baseball classic has uh, revived an interest in the game. I hope so. I hope so. Obviously, what's going on in Israel right now speaks for itself, uh, and people are are focused on other things. But I know that participation more than more than doubled within the country in the last six years because of the success our international team has had. Uh, we've used the prize money from our tournaments and donor funds to build more stadiums, more baseball fields in the country. Because if they have nowhere to play, then they can't play baseball. So uh, when I first started playing for the team in 2016, there was only one baseball field in the whole country. Now there's three, and we're working on a fourth. Um, if you build it, hopefully they will they will come. Yeah. And if they have somewhere to play, uh, hopefully there will be more people playing. I want to get back, back to the book. Uh, I, I hear it took quite a while to to write it. Is that yeah, good? it took it took me four tries to get it right. Um, because the story and the message came first from delivering it to an adult audience, there was a lot more complexity. There was a lot more layers uh, that I included when I tell the story. Uh, finding meaning in my professional career, uh, finding meaning uh, in religion and spiritual identity. 
But when you write a children's book, you really got to boil it down to what is the one main point that you're trying to make, because some of these concepts are too complex for a, a six to a nine year old. So the first time I, I tried to write the book, uh, I submitted a manuscript to, to a couple publishers and they said, listen, we love the, the topic, but this isn't right. Try again. So I wrote it again. Um, I submitted it. They said, listen, this is really close, uh, but we're still not interested. So I, I ended up shelving it for about a year and a half. And in that time where I, I put it on the back burner, I had a daughter and I was reading her kids books and I gravitated towards the same two books that I wanted to read every night. And I thought to myself, eventually, why is my book not like these two and how is it different? And I ended up using these two books that I gravitated towards reading as a guidepost on how to make mine uh, a version of a book that I would enjoy to read myself. And thank goodness, because now I've been to schools all over the country reading this book, and I actually really enjoy reading it. The, uh, it's a chicken and egg story, of course. I imagine the words come before the illustration, because the illustration yeah. must be matched to. How did you go about finding uh, an illustrator? I actually interviewed multiple illustrators, and there was there was one, one page of the book that I thought was the most important uh and i can i can open to that page now i wanted this image to be right uh because in, in my mind it was it was especially before the book existed the the page of us standing on the foul line before the game with our keep out on and the and all the flags hanging on the same level this to me was the most important image to get right so i interviewed a few people and I can show you, I still have uh, the, the drafts that I got from other people. Um, I wanted to make sure they got that right. And, and eventually, the illustrator that I ended up going with found me. He was interested in, this is, a, this is an earlier iteration of that draft where we were more cartoony and small. Mm -hmm. um, this was a, a different artist's version of it where it was, you know, you can see it's a different style. Yeah, it's just the Israeli flag. Much more, uh, much more simplistic. Um, and I think I had a third, but you get the idea. Um, the illustrator, Chris Brown, who was super talented, and I'm, I'm very grateful I got to work with, he contacted me via LinkedIn, asking if I would help him access other Major League Baseball players for his kid's book. And I said, well, I, I love your art. Would you be interested in, in working with mine and I'll work with yours? So I sent him my manuscript. Uh, he really loved the story. He believed in it. And he ended up insisting that he work on my book uh, for free because he, he believed in the story. Even as a non-Jew, he believed that the story needed to be heard and needed to be done right. So Chris and I have developed a wonderful relationship. We still talk almost daily uh, we're trying to come up with other projects we can do together uh, because we just enjoy each other so much. Did did I read that that Chris is a, also a former ball player? Yeah, Chris played in the minor leagues uh, for five minutes, and uh, <laughs> now he he has become an art teacher. But he has combined his two passions of art and sports, and is the official artist for the Louisiana State Sports Hall of Fame. Wow! Yeah. So what, what are your plans now that you're out of the game as a player? That's a great question. I'm, I'm transitioning. I, I certainly don't plan on writing a ton of more books. I think this might have been a one and done, or perhaps I'll write a mindset book um, at some point on, on helping people try to get to their mindset. What I'm doing right now is a lot is speaking, uh, leadership coaching and speaking about mindset and leadership. Uh, I'm wondering, your daughter is how old at this point? One and a half. So she, she's not old enough to understand uh, what, what you've done, but at some point, I'm sure it'll be a very proud moment for you to share that with her. And uh, and I know there, there's much more video around that you can show her of what, what you did. Uh, and that, that that's going to be a very sweet moment. Uh, I, I could see you writing another book about your experiences in the World Baseball Classic. And I, I know 
it, it's a common story. Uh, a lot of your fellow, uh, your your co-religionists were not brought up with religion, and they go to Israel, and it does transform them. And I, I and you have been speaking with adult uh, audiences, and I can see this as an extension of that. So I hope you'll you'll consider that uh, at some point. Uh, people people have asked if I would be willing to write uh, maybe even a young adult version of the book or or something for adult audiences and it may be something that i end up pursuing uh but for the time being i i'm really proud of how this kids book turned out uh the target age group audience is six to nine year olds but i've had adults told tell me that they have read it and it made them cry in a good way because they can appreciate it for what it is right like it rhymes it's meant for a young audience but it, it is my it is my vulnerable true story and about how this experience changed my life. And a lot of people I think can relate to feeling half and half of whatever that is, right? Whether they have one parent uh, that's uh, Mexican or Filipino or black or or Jewish or or anything. I think a lot of people feel torn in their own self-identity. Um, and they can see themselves in the character, whether baseball is their passion and Judaism is their community, or it's a totally unrelated community and passion, uh, they can still relate to doing what you love and finding where you belong. We have been talking with Ryan LaVarnway, author of Base One Belonging. A pleasure to talk to you, sir. Continued success and uh, hope to see you down the line. Yeah, Ron, thank you so much.